Good morning. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, my goodness. Glory to God. This life that we have in Christ is like, oh, so good. Yes, amen. Free, free to be who we really are. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, it was a... Um, it was an either or. Either I could take the time to blow dry my hair or write down some scriptures that I wanted to share. So I chose the scripture. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> ah, glory to God. My cup is full and overflowing. Amen. Hallelujah. I am so thankful. And, oh my goodness, I just wish I could just pour out everything that was poured into me this morning. And uh, But you know what? I'm just an earthen vessel. Amen. And so, Holy Ghost, help me. Help me to articulate what you've put in my heart this morning. Amen. Glory to God. Oh my goodness. God is so good. And I am so thankful. You know, the first thing that hit me this morning was if we still see self, then we've not been persuaded by the faith of the Son of God. Because as I, I ministered in a message recently, Christ is my new eye. Christ is my new identity. Amen. And you know, the Apostle Paul said, the love of Christ constrains me. I mean, it's got me in a grip. Uh, because, because of this, something he knew. And you know, it's all about what we know. Amen. It's all about what we know. And the scripture says that, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 14, I think it is. Uh, I think I wrote it down. No, I didn't. I, I already did, honey. Um, the love of Christ constrains me. For I thus judge that if one man died, then all men are dead, that henceforth we know no man after the flesh but after the Spirit. <clears throat> That's it right there. <clears throat> Knoweth no man after the flesh. Now that isn't just talking, hey, Brenda, God bless you, love. That's not just talking about knowing everybody else according to the Spirit, but it's knowing you according to the Spirit so that you can say with the Apostle Paul, I was crucified. I, the self-life, was crucified with Christ Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ now liveth in me. That's your new I. Christ is your new I. So if you hear a word of condemnation uh, that says, oh, look at what you did, um, and you take the bait, you're still knowing yourself according to the flesh. And um, a scripture is just coming to me right now in Romans 8 uh, let's see here he says verse 33 who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect who is going to judge you who is going to accuse you it is God that justified listen kids I mean let this sink down deep in your heart it is God that has justified you. It is God through his wisdom, through his logic, that has persuaded your heart that you are justified, that you are innocent, okay? So if God is the one that justified you, who is anybody else to condemn you? And that means your own heart. Who are you to condemn yourself when it's God that's already justified you? Who is he that condemns you? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? 
shall tribulation, shall distress, persecution, the, the whole thing, whatever. Contradictory circumstances come against us and we'll say, oh, look at you. You're separated from God. God doesn't love you. Listen, our heart has to be totally persuaded of God's love for us. That's why the Apostle Paul prayed in Ephesians that you, that Christ, would dwell in your heart by faith, that the wisdom of Christ would dwell in your heart by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. Listen, rooted and grounded? I mean, have you ever, have you ever tried to pull something out that had really deep roots? I mean, you can pull and pull and pull, and that sucker ain't going to let go. And I'll tell you, oh, glory to God. We are like trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, whose roots go down deep into the river of God. It's the river of God's love. Amen. We have got to be totally, our hearts have got to be totally persuaded of God's love for us, that no matter what comes our way, amen, we will be established in grace. The scripture says it's a good thing that the heart be established in grace. What does that mean? Grace is the divine influence. Amen. That we are living under the divine influence of God's love for us. That no lie can ever come and knock us off our feet. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Oh my goodness. This is just so good. And you know, I was listening to Greg this morning and he was talking about um, living by faith. And he was saying, you know, we are the children of Abraham by faith, okay? We are blessed with Abraham. Abraham was the father of faith. You know, he believed God and it was accounted unto him as righteousness. Well, when we believe God, when we believe what God says about us, okay, it is imputes to us a state of righteousness where there is no more shame or guilt or knowing ourselves after the flesh. This is the most glorious place to be. And Greg was saying, he said, you know, you can't go and tell people you need to read your Bible, you need to pray more, you need to give, you need to love, you need to do this, do that. You can't attain to this thing by works. Hey, Lisa! You can't get there by that, okay? It's only by believing. What did the Apostle Paul say to the Galatians? He says, you know, let me ask you this one question. Um, How did you receive the Spirit? Was it by the works of the law? Was it by something you did? Or was it by hearing the faith? Good morning, sweetheart. Okay, so how did you receive the Spirit? Was it by something you did, or was it the free gift of God as you listened to the message and your heart was persuaded that this was the truth, and then God validated that by giving you a spirit? <laughs> it was by hearing. And so you have to understand that. It's not like, well, if I read my Bible, God will bless me. Or if I pray, God will bless me. No. But when we hear the word, then our heart is persuaded more. Amen? Because faith comes, or the logic or the wisdom of God comes as we listen to the word of Christ. Okay? So you've got to understand, I want you to get this. It's not because you read your Bible or you pray or you do this or you do that that you are going to grow in grace. No. It's by continually hearing what God says that your heart is persuaded more and more. You know, this is what came to my heart this morning. You know, Mary was impregnated by the incarnated Christ. The Holy Spirit put in her womb the physical Jesus. Well, by the hearing of faith, the Holy Spirit has put Christ in us. Okay? And the scripture tells us that we are born again of an incorruptible seed. 
Well, the scripture tells us, remember when Jesus uh, and his family and all the Jews went up for the feast days and then his parents left and then they discover Jesus isn't with them and they have to go back and they're looking for him and they find him in the temple. What was he doing? He was reading uh, the scripture. He was studying the scripture. And they said, how could you do this to us, you know? And he said, didn't you know that I had to be about my father's business? You see, he was, he was, he was um, reading the word. And the scripture says that he went down from there, submitted himself. That, uh, that just blows my mind. I remember the first time I see that. He submitted himself unto his parents. And, you know, that was the order of things. He was to submit himself to his parents, even though they didn't even have a clue what was going on, okay? And it says, and he grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. See, Jesus grew, okay? Now, if Jesus, who was the Son of God, God himself, wrapped up in human flesh, had to grow in wisdom, how much more do we have to do the same thing? So you see, we've been born again by the Word of God, but then the Apostle Paul prayed, I think it was in uh, Galatians 4, he says, I travail in birth again. See, he travailed, he interceded for these people that they would receive the engrafted Word that was able to save their soul. And then he says, I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. In other words, he's saying, I want to see you grow up into the full stature of Christ. And so how does this happen? How do we grow? The apostle Peter said for us to grow in grace and the knowledge of our Savior, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, how do we grow in grace? Well, in Ephesians 4, the scripture says that before Jesus um, ascended, he gave gifts. He gave some apostles and some prophets, some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. You know, these are all teaching. These are all uh, word gifts to the church. These are all speaking the word of Christ. For what? For the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. You see, this, these uh, word gifts are given to the body of Christ that we may come to know who we truly are, that we in turn can minister this gospel to everybody we come in contact with. I mean, when you come into, when you come into your true identity, uh, it's not like the Great Commission, you know, God commanded you to go into all the world and teach. You know, the Lord said this to the Jews because up till then, the oracles of God were given to Israel. And he's, all he was saying is, hey guys, this isn't just for you. This is for the whole world. But yet the carnal mind has taken that scripture and said, God commanded you to do it. Listen, there's no passion in following a command. This word has got to be born in our heart. The wild horses can't keep you from sharing this glorious truth. Amen? I mean, it's so messed up where the church has been teaching people to go and do this and do that because, you know, in the, the Bible study the other night, we were talking about Paul and how Paul said, the love of Christ constrains me. I mean, the love of Christ has got me in a vice and I got to tell everybody. 
I said, you know, this is a passion that's born in our heart through the love of God. I said, you know, when somebody comes up to you and says, well, you know, God commanded us to love one another. I guarantee you, they've never had this passion. Because if they had this passion born in their heart, they would realize how lame it is for them to say such a thing. Because you see, they're still going by the external commandments. I mean, I got a commandment in my heart, which is the law of life in Christ Jesus that has set me free from the law of sin and death. The love of God that makes me want to share this wonderful life and experience with everybody I come in contact with. Amen. So it says, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of their ministry, for the for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come into the unity of the faith you know when I see that is all I can think of is um, I think it was the two and a half tribes that wanted to settle this side of Jordan and not go into the promised land and uh, they asked Moses can we have this land over here we don't want to go over there and Moses asked the Lord, and the Lord says, sure, you can stay there, but you can't inherit your possession until you help your brothers inherit theirs. You have to go in and help them possess their possession. And, and you know what? This is so beautiful. Glory to God. This is what the Lord was showing me this morning. I cannot be satisfied until I see my brother set free. Amen. <laughs> I cannot, I, love cannot really uh, revel in what we have until my brothers and sisters get it too. And then we can all join in the dance with the Holy Ghost and enjoy this glorious life together. Because you've got to realize something. It's not me. It's us. It's community. This is koinonia. This is the communion of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it's so glorious. It says, Till we all come into the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, I mean, you see that, beloved, Christ in us. As we grow in grace and the knowledge of what we've received, Christ in us is growing big in us. Amen. Hallelujah. And you know, this morning, as I was meditating on that scripture, and then the scripture in 2 Corinthians 5, about knowing no man after the flesh. I said to my husband, I said, could you imagine a community of believers that's hearts are so persuaded of Christ in them and Christ in everybody else that they see no man according to the flesh but after the spirit? I mean, wow no pointing of the finger, no judgmental spirit, no criticism. Glory to God. It's just, it's just an amp, this life in Christ is absolutely beautiful. And you know, uh, yesterday I was, um, I was thinking about David and this was now you got to realize it was in um, second it was in first Samuel 16 13 where David was anointed to be king okay uh, and then you know a lot of water went under the bridge and <coughs> King Saul's out to kill him and he's hiding and uh, while he's in hiding uh, there was a guy named Nabal, and he had a load of sheep. And David's men decided to be, you know, nice guys and help <laughs> these sheep shearers. So they labored and, and did the work. And then they went back to David, and David said, you know, what did they give you? And he said, nothing. 
He said, you go down and tell them that, you know, you come from David and, um, you know, give me something from my higher, you know. Well, Nabal, which means fool, turned around and dishonored David's men, shaved their heads and cut their garments so their buttocks were showing. I mean, really shamed them. And they went back to David. And David was one ticked off soul, okay? And he's like, that's it. I'm going to, I'm going to go, let's go. I'm going to go down there. I'm going to kill them all. And he went with 400 men. Now David is in the flesh. And yet David has been anointed to be king. And one of his guys runs ahead and tells Nabal's wife, Abigail, and she was a wise woman. And she prepared all manner of victuals for David and his men and loaded up the camels and went out to meet David. And Abigail, oh my goodness, I want to read to you. Let me see if I can find it. First Samuel, this is so good, kids. We can learn because this is a picture and a type. Amen. Uh, 25... Was it for Samuel? Oh. Okay. Okay, let's see. Here it is. It's in First uh, Samuel 25, 28. She says, I pray thee, forgive the trespass of thy handmaid. Wait a minute. Let me back up. 23. And Abigail saw David... When Abigail saw David, she hasted and lighted off the ass and fell before David on her face and bowed herself to the ground and fell at his feet and said, unto, uh, said, Upon me, my Lord, upon me let this iniquity be, and let thine handmaid, I pray thee, speak in thine audience and hear the words of thine handmaid. Let not my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial, or of the devil, even Nabal, for his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, thine handmaid, saw not the young men of my Lord, whom thou did send. Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, seeing the Lord hath withholden from thee, from coming to shed blood, and from avenging thyself with thine own hand. Don't avenge yourself with your own hand. Now let thine enemies and they that seek evil to my Lord be as Nabal. And now this blessing which thine handmaid has brought unto my Lord, let it even be given unto the young men that follow my Lord. I pray thee, forgive the trespass of thy handmaid, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house. Listen, she is speaking to the king in David. Even though he's not reigning king right now, he's been anointed, and she's speaking to the king in him, to that real him. She says, The Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house, because my Lord fighteth the battles of the Lord, and evil hath not been found in thee all thy days. Man, you have been, you've been doing right. Yet a man is risen to pursue thee and to seek thy soul. But the soul of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of life with the Lord thy God and the souls of thine enemies. Then shall he sling out as out of the midst of a sling. Oh my goodness, isn't that something? Just like he did to Goliath out of his sling. And it shall come to pass when the Lord shall have done to my Lord according to all the good that he's spoken concerning thee. And shall have appointed the ruler over Israel. You see, she's reminding him, hallelujah, of his destiny. That this shall be no grief unto thee, nor offense of heart unto my Lord. Either that thou hast shed blood causeless, or that my Lord has avenged himself. But when the Lord shall have dealt well with my Lord, then remember thy handmaid. Wow. And David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which sent thee this day to meet thee. And blessed be thy advice, and blessed be thou. 
which has kept me this day from coming to shed blood and from avenging myself with mine own hand. Glory to God. She prevented him from fighting his own battle and reminded him of who he was and reminded him the battle is the Lord's. And you know, that reminds me of the advice that um, Paul gave to Timothy. He said, um, oh Jesus, where is it? Here, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. The servant of the Lord must not strive, don't be argumentative, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach and patient. In meekness, instructing those who oppose themselves. See, David was opposing himself right now. He got in the flesh and he was like, you know what? This guy insulted me, man. I am going to, I am going to destroy him. But she was a servant of the Lord and she came and she reminded David of who he was. It says in meekness, instructing those that impose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance, will, will give them the, the ability to change the way they're thinking. Because if they've gone out of the way, they're, they're believing a lie. So you come and you remind them of the truth of who they truly are. Remembering Peter, he says, if these things be in you, these virtues be in you and abound, you'll never be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But if any man lacks these things, he's blind and he's forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. So you see, David forgot who he was and Abigail was reminding him. And it says... Uh, that God peradventure will give him repentance to the acknowledging the truth that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Amen. The enemy wants to take us captive by getting us to believe the lie. That's why it's so important that our heart be established in grace and truth. Amen. Amen. And we have a right. So God bless you. I hope this blessed you. And uh, have an awesome day. Amen. Bye-bye.